Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith, which comes down to us from Jesus and the apostles. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, and be passionate about it, and even be able to defend it. And sometimes on our show, as you know, we have special guests who are experts in their field or who have written a book or who have a particular testimony. Today, yep. we have a wonderful testimony from Emra Oral, and he was actually a Muslim who converted to the Catholic Church. He was a Muslim who was born in Turkey, and he moved to the United States and uh, worked in the corporate world for a while. And he traveled every year back and forth to Turkey. And eventually, he had many demonic attacks, as I understand it, and he had a profound powerful experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, who changed his whole life upside down and backwards. And he ended up um, coming to Christianity and eventually to the Catholic faith. And this is going to be his story. So thank you so much, Emra, for joining us on the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Brian. It's good to be on. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. And um, I know that you are a convert, as we just talked about. And um a lot of people don't know about Islam. You know, they have heard about Muslims. There's a lot of perhaps stereotypes. There's probably a lot of uh, misunderstandings about Muslims. But, you know, perhaps before we get to how you even found Jesus and Christianity in the first place, maybe we can start with um, a little bit of, about your background, about Islam. I mean, what are some of the basic beliefs and tenets of Islam that you grew up with and that you are accustomed to believing? Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. Um so what I did, Brian, is uh, I kind of mapped out in chronological order, in a logical fashion, a summary of Islam, uh, both just from um, what historically happened as well as the theological main point. And then we can get into uh, kind of where my story starts from there, because I think I'll give a good, uh, I'll paint a good picture of what Islam is and exactly what Muslims believe and how they act and why they act, etc. So let's start there. Muslim is someone who follows Islam. It is submission to Islam. Islam is an action, and it means submission to God. So both Christians and Muslims, or at least Muslims, let me speak for them, believe that God revealed himself to humanity in many different ways during ancient times. Um, Christians believe that God, or when, as I've learned Christianity, we believe that God chose to re reveal himself in a final universal way through Jesus, but through the actual person of Jesus, God was revealed. Jesus is God, 100% God, 100% man. So Christianity, as I was learning Christianity, was the ultimate revelation was through the man Jesus. However, Muslims believe that God's final universal revelation uh, was through a written text called the Quran. Archangel Gabriel dictated to the prophet Muhammad, and this started in 610 AD and lasted for about 22, 23 years to 632 AD. So, so an angel... So you're saying an angel appeared to Mohammed for two decades and gave him these supposed messages? That's correct. That's correct. And how did he remember all of that? Uh, he would he would go to a uh, to a cave um, uh, at the Mount of Hira, and what he would do there is he would go there to meditate and 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 pray and relax. He grew up in what was Mecca at now uh, known as Mecca. It was in Saudi Arabia, and it was a polytheistic culture. It had many idols, many worships, uh, many god types of um, uh, god worship, etc. And according to tradition and history, Muhammad was a very pious. Um, a very pious man. So he would retreat to this cave to pray. And then on finally one day in 610 AD, the Gabriel or the Archangel Gabriel appeared to him and he said, recite. And then he began to dictate the Quran directly to Muhammad, who then repeated it to his followers. And over time, the followers began to scribe those down. Technically, Muhammad was illiterate, so he did not write the Quran. And to be fair, it might it, he claimed it was the angel Gabriel. It doesn't mean it was, right? That, that's correct. That's correct. According to tradition, it was Gabriel who gave the direct word of God to Muhammad. <clears throat> now, if you don't mind me asking another question, he didn't, as I understand it, he didn't think it was an angel right away, right? Because the angel was very rough with him and scared him out of his his, his pants in a sense, right? What Did he think it was something else? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um Tradition has it in the way I was taught it is that it was Gabriel. However, when this angel came um, to Muhammad to start revealing God's final word, which is the which ended up being the Quran, Muhammad felt was very frightened. Yes, he ran back home, etc. But he also felt like he was being suffocated. He was being strangled. 
So there was certainly that aspect to it. Um, it was it was an uncomfortable experience to say the least. The experience was so powerful and overwhelming that the like we were just talking about the prophet rushed home in a terrified state, uh, relaying the incident first to his wife and supporter Khadija. Now Khadija was an older woman than Muhammad, and she was primarily responsible for telling Muhammad these are revelations from God. In my understanding, of course, we were not there, but in my understanding, Muhammad was not sure what was going on. This was not a pleasant experience. He was being suffocated. He was being overwhelmed by this crushing force uh, is always the way I, I heard it. But Khadija, his wife said, no, this is a message of God. You are the messenger of God. You must continue to go there. You must continue to receive these revelations. You are the sought after prophet. So Khadija was a huge player in the development of Islam and the, in the development of the Quran. And she was like 15 years older than he was, wasn't she? She was significantly older. Yes. Yes. She was, but, she was quite wealthy as well. So the finances came from Khadija. The moral support came from Khadija. All of this happened when Muhammad was approximately 40 years old. Okay. So, you know, 40 is also a very biblical number, but just by chance, he was also <laughs> 40 years old, you know? So when Muhammad started to get these revelations and uh, it started with, you know, one God, a monotheistic God, etc. When he started to get these revelations, this went against the whole pagan system in Mecca. And he began to preach this. And as he began to preach the one God monotheistic system, it went against the whole infrastructure, economic, political, social, religion of the most powerful tribe there, even though he was born into the Qureshi tribe. So he fled to a, a town called Medina. And I think it was 622 uh, AD. He fled several hundred miles north to Medina. Um, and, uh, and at that time, he kind of reestablished his base in Medina. He became a respected individual in Medina. In 632, approximately 10 years later, he came back to Mecca. He had about 10,000 followers at that time. And uh, it, they were the military force was powerful enough that there was actually no conflict. Uh, the Mecca was turned over and Islam began to sprout from there. So at a high level, that's kind of what happened. Okay, so he got chased out, kind of gathered this huge army behind him, and then came back <laughs> to uh, the place where he had started. That's right. He also died in 632 AD. That's correct. That's exactly right. And someone told me that Muhammad uh, led armies onto the battlefield pretty much to his entire life until he died. Is that true? Uh, to my understanding, yes. It was a very, um, um, yeah, it was a very warlike type of tribe against tribe political system at that time. So there was a lot of battling. There was a lot of, there was a lot of bloodshed and there was a lot of action along those lines for sure. Yes, definitely. Okay. But I think for, I think for the, for the listeners, I just want to get one point across because this is, this was, was so hard for me when I converted um, from, from Muslim and I wasn't looking to convert by the way, and I'll get into that, but you know, for us, God revealed himself in Jesus. God is Jesus, you know, the Trinity, three in one. The important thing that I want people to understand is that the Quran is to Muslims what Jesus is to us. Okay, Muhammad is not to Muslims what Jesus is to us. The Quran is. It is the ultimate revelation of, of the final word of God. Why did this have to happen? Because tradition and history, at least the way I was taught, was that the, the Bible, whether it was parts of the Old Testament or the New Testament, became corrupted over time. Um, so it was to Muhammad came, Gabriel came to Muhammad to reveal the final word in order to reestablish everything, to set everything correct, get everyone back on the right path and to, to go on with proper worship of God. So amazing how many people have claimed that in history. I mean, the Muslims claimed that, you know, somewhere, somewhere along the lines, it all got corrupted. And so he had to yeah. fix it all. And then, you know, Martin Luther claimed that, oh, it, you know, they all got it wrong. So I'm going to fix it all. And then, you know, Mary uh, <clears throat> Baker Reddy, the founder of the Christian scientists, has said the same thing. Uh, Ellen Gould White, founder of Seventh-day Adventists, has said yeah. the same thing. The Mormons claim the same thing. The Church of God, the Church of Christ. I mean, all of these churches and religions have claimed that, oh, well, it got corrupted. But very few offer, you know, a lot of proof. And I hear Muslims, Muslim apologists say, oh, the Bible got corrupted. The Bible got corrupted. They never offer any proof and they never show, oh, well, here's what the original documents were. And here's where it went wrong. They just throw out these claims that I've never really seen it well defended. 
actually, there is tremendous um, uh, research and, and, and history of research with respect to biblical accuracy, both from biblical Christian sources and from secular sources uh, on the validity. In fact, uh, at least I think it's six or seven um, of the books in the New Testament are used by any skeptic as factual historical books. So if you don't use them to defend Christianity, so to speak, your, your critics accept as well. That's how well they are proven from a historical accuracy perspective. You know, it, Christianity, I define as being named after G, after Christ. Let's say Judaism was named after or is named after the tribe of Judah. OK, Yahweh, God, um, Adonai, mean my Lord. Islam is named after an action. OK, what is that action? That action is submission. And again, a Muslim is a person who carries out that action of submission to God. God is Allah. Allah just means God in Arabic. Yeah, so that's have, interesting because so many Muslims have always always told me, oh, Islam means peace. Islam means peace. I'm like, it does not mean, I know better, and it does not mean peace. It means submit. Yeah, it, that that correct. It's named after an action, if you want. Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, as I was brought up, we were, as Islamic followers, we were supposed to find peace by following our submission to God. But it, the whole idea is this fact of submission. So that was a big part of the entire, well, that is a big part of the entire religion. Yeah, so, yeah. indeed. And, and that's what they wanted everyone else to do, too. They wanted them to submit, you know, <clears throat> willingly or otherwise <laughs> to, to Islam, right? I guess that's why they were. Yeah, I guess that's why there was over a thousand years of warfare, you know, they're gonna a lot of submission there. Yeah. Over the next 1400 years, actually, it just spread like wildfire, primarily through mil military domination, North Africa, India, what we know now is India, Pakistan, Turkey, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, and as you know, or as you may know, um, they were they barely were stopped at the gates of Vienna as they were entering in Europe um, uh, for the for the European push, so to speak. So yeah. that was so and that's a that's an interesting story, too. I, um, I didn't take any notes on it, but I remember reading it some time ago. It was very, very close to them actually breaking down the walls and getting into Vienna. And had Vienna fallen, I believe Europe would have fallen as well. So. The whole history of Islam is uh, scary, but also, you know, interesting. It is interesting because just how God intervened here in the early. This is the way, way I've read history, you know. So many times I feel like Islam should have taken over the world, except that they were stopped in like key spots where they just couldn't continue, like with Charles Martel in the 700s with his Franks. I mean, they were the only ones who could stop the power of the Muslims at the time. And then, yeah. you know, with the Battle of Lepanto and even at times Muslims, I feel like we're going to take over the world. There weren't Christian armies or any army that could stop them. But then they ended up having this infighting and they ended up like wiping out each other. And like, if they hadn't done that, I feel like they would have been powerful enough to take out anybody. It's just, it's so interesting. The history of warfare in Islam. Yeah. There, there's a lot. I mean, with Lepanto, uh, it was, I believe 30 to 40,000 professionally trained Ottoman Turks versus what? Five, 6,000 unofficial European Christians. And yet in that war, you know, the whole Turkish Navy Ottoman fleet or a big part of it was destroyed. That was truly a miracle. I mean, the yeah. odds of that happening are impossible. And Malta was the same thing. Mm -hmm. When the Turks were coming into Malta, we had five, six, seven thousand Christian defenders in the forts there. Right. They had about I don't remember the exact number. So maybe 20,000, 30,000. Again, again, invading um, Islamic forces. And yet Malta stood. And if they had gone Malta, they would have jumped rope right into Rome, which was the, which was the goal all along anyway. So yeah. there have been miracles, absolute miracles in the history. Once you begin to peel back the layers. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what you have next, but um, if you have something else, you can let me know. Or um, I think it would be interesting to do the five pillars of Islam, like the five core beliefs of Islam. That would be uh, yeah. Very interesting. And let me just say right off that uh, the bat that, you know, I think it's interesting that, you know, Jesus was persecuted all the time. I mean, he was chased out of town all the time. And Muhammad was persecuted. That's, there's no doubt about that. He was chased out of Mecca. He went to Medina. But Jesus Christ didn't come back with an army of, <laughs> of 10,000. You know what I mean? Whereas, you know, he actually loved his enemies even 
when they killed him, you know, he said, love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. And I find that, you know, while the two religions start out similar, when he comes back with 10,000, the rest of his entire life is warfare. And then 25 years after that, they're taking the entire fertile crescent of the Middle East. And within a hundred years, they've spread across Asia and Africa and completely different than, you know, Catholicism, Christianity, and the way that the two religions, you know, operate. It's just interesting. Uh, they are diametrically opposed from that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Diametrically. Yeah. 180 degrees. Yeah. And uh, w- w- I hope to do another um, video on the Crusades because this is kind of all the backdrop of why the Crusades were started in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everyone thinks, uh, let me just interject here. Um, and I'm trying not to be, uh, I'm trying to be historical, um, although I right. certainly have my own opinion about it. But, you know, as I was growing up, I was taught that the Crusades were the Christian armies invading Islamic territory. You know, that was not true. The, Islam was pushing out, you know, the, I mean, it, if there was no response, then it would have continued to push out in a forceful fashion. I mean, the Crusades were established to try to stop the invasion of what were and still are Christian territories. So there's a lot of misconceptions there that the, that Christian Europe tried to invade Islamic territory, whatever the case may be. Now, this was more, I mean, everyone has their take on Jerusalem, but this was a, this was a, um, an aggressive force that was pushing out and a defensive perimeter had to be established and thus the Crusades began. So I think that's an important point. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Now, with the five pillars of Islam, so what does that mean? There are five key practices that all Muslims are obligated to fulfill throughout their lifetime. These practices are referred to as pillars because they form the foundation of Muslim life. Number one, shahaha, which simply means faith. What that means is, as a Muslim, you start every day or, or your prayers five times a day with there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Again, going back to the fact that the Quran is to Muslims what Christ was to, to us, the Christians. Salah, prayer. The ritual prayer required of every Muslim, and this happens five times a day. I'm sure many people have heard that. We are required to pray five times a day, basically morning, um, afternoon, night, and then two in between times, you know, the the 10 and three o'clock period. Zakat means tithing or almsgiving. Typically, it's 2.5% to 10% of your salary of, of um, of whatever money you make for that week, for that month, is called zakat. That's the third part of the pillar. So we have faith. Which the, with the declaration that uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is messenger. We have five times a day prayer. We have uh, tithing, 2.5 to 10%. We have fasting. We fast one month or is Muslims fast one month during the fast of Ramadan. That is a fast from dusk to dawn. Nothing is allowed during the time that the sun rises to the sun ends. There's no water. There's no food. If you're a smoker, there's oh. no smoke. There's no you know, there, there, there's no physical activities um, as well. So there wow, is that's pretty hardcore. Yeah, it is, especially during the summer, because the Islamic calendar changes. It's not every year at the same time. So in the summer, it can be very challenging. Mm-hmm. And Ramadan is the month where the revelation from God through Gabriel to Muhammad in the cave of Hira, uh, that's when it started. That's why Ramadan is celebrated. And then there's the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage. Every Muslim is required to go to Mecca at least one time in their life. This, to me, as I was brought up, was a um, uh, uh, to remember to um, uh, to relive or to um, kind of bring back to memory Muhammad's pilgrimage from Mecca when he started getting into some trouble with the Qureshi tribe, which was the dominant tribe once again in Mecca to Medina. That was the Hajj, the initial Hajj, and now every every um, and then back in six thirty two, and every Muslim is required to go to um, to Mecca at least once a, once a year if they can financially and medically. Okay. So those are the five pillars. Interesting, and I know that Islam has very differing beliefs about what would be the center of our religion, Jesus Christ. I mean, we believe that Jesus was God. We believe he was the Son of God. We believe he was uh, the word of God, you know, eternal word, uncreated word that has been in existence forever. He is existence itself. And he became man. He took on human flesh. But that's not what Muslims believe, is it? What do they believe about Jesus? So actually, Islam and Christianity share many of the same prophets. Um, Here, hang on one second. They actually, um, 
Um, Abraham was the father of all, so to speak, uh, in, in Islamic history. But Moses, Isaac, Ishmael, um, Mother Mary, Jesus, these were all characters or all, all characters uh, in the Quran. In fact, Jesus is mentioned 97 times in the Quran across 93 verses. He is called the spirit of God in the Quran in several areas. And Mary is the only woman named in Islam, uh, in, named in the Quran, uh, the Islamic text. And she is actually mentioned 70 times. So Jesus and Mary are very, very um, honored and, and esteemed in the Quran. However, there is there, they, they were uh, messengers of God before Muhammad. In other words, they were just, Jesus was just a prophet. He was just the teacher. Mary was a very holy woman, a good woman. Um, but again, she played a role as a human being. Jesus was just a prophet, and that was where it started and ended. However, he is esteemed and redeemed in, in the Muslim culture. Can you talk about shirk? Which is like the one of the biggest sins in Islam. Um, you know, the attributing of a son to God or anyone on, you know, God, like nobody can be like God. Nobody's close oh, I, to God. I, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. That it's, it goes without saying. Yeah. I mean, in Islam, God has no son. There's only one God, one entity. Shirk is the most cardinal thing you can do is to associate anything with God. That means son of God, any type of any type of idol, I guess that would be considered. So that would be the primary uh, primary sin that would be unforgivable. You cannot do that in any way, shape or form. So basically, Christians are committing an unforgivable sin by making Jesus Christ the son of God when they say, no, he's only a prophet. He could never, ever be the son of God. Correct. They, the, the Quran and the Bible are very, very, very different along those lines. It doesn't matter if we share the same prophets, even if we have the same, if we have texts that have similar descriptions on how the, how these individuals live, um, even if they match up between the two texts, um, the central point is Jesus and Jesus in the, in the Quranic text was just a man, just a prophet. In fact, Muhammad had to come after Jesus to set things right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, you know, and I made a video on that. I don't know if you ever saw the video, but I keep having more and more Muslims are just getting online. I don't even think most of them speak English. They have this copy and paste stuff that they just put everywhere. But, you know, I respond to them. You know, they said, you know, Jesus is not the son of God. Mohammed's his prophet, blah, blah, blah. And I say, you know, Jesus walked on water. Jesus forgave sins and claimed the authority to do so. Jesus healed people who are blind, sick, deaf, diseased. He raised people from the dead. He himself raised from the dead. I mean, he, in, in, in Islamic tradition, he could speak as a baby. He could, you know, turn clay into a bird. Like he could do miracles on command. And I say, you know what? Where's, where's the, where, where's the same kind of miracles in Islam for Muhammad? And, you know, I, I don't see the same thing. One seems far, far above the other, in my opinion. So that is exactly what led to my conversion. Um, and, and I won't get into the whole thing right now, but just very, very quickly, um, the Bible itself is full of actual miracles. And the Bible is many, I mean, just proven to be even historically accurate, not only theologically, but historically with dates and times and other sources. The Bible has been researched uh, tremendously from, again, Christian literature and non-Christian literature. Then after the Bible, with the, with the name of Jesus, with the apparitions of Mary, etc., miracles continue to happen, verified, approved miracles, not just by the Catholic Church or by Christians, but by scientists, agnostic, atheists, etc. The only miracle in the Quran, as I mentioned earlier, was simply that the text was so beautifully written that it could not have been human. Now, there are miracles in the Hadith. Um, however, um, they, the Hadith is not the word of God, and I've never really researched the, the validity of the miracles in the Hadith. Um, I never really went that far on the, on that side. So, but there are not a, any miracles in the Quran. Yeah. I don't really know too many. The only one I know of that I heard, and I don't even know if it's a Hadith or not, but you know, uh, is, uh, Muhammad supposedly rode a unicorn or some sort of a horse to Mecca just flew right. on it. Apparently. <laughs> right. Right. He went up to God and then came back down. Correct. On a horse or something, right? It was like a yeah, flying horse. It, it was a winged horse. Okay. Yeah. And horse. I guess it had steps that were like, you know, it wouldn't be like a regular horse steps. It would be like, like 
a hundred horse steps in one step or something like that. It was like a, a big creature. As I understand it, I haven't studied it in a lot of depth, but I just, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the opposite of what you're saying is that, you know, that's a claim. Even the, even for me, the Quran being beautiful is a subjective claim, you know, but whereas, you know, I talk about in some of my other videos, the miracle of the atomic bomb, which was yeah. investigated by 200 scientists who had no natural explanation for it, or, you know, the miracles at Lords, where they have a panel of 30 doctors and many of them are atheist and secular humanists are not even Christian and they're verifying these miracles. So, you know, I think there's a, a, a big difference between the two. Yeah. I mean, when I started to go down this path, I mean, look at, look at 1917 Fatima, the miracle of the sun witnessed by 70,000 people. In addition to what happened with the sun spinning in the sky and coming crashing on the earth and the ground was soaked with water and all of a sudden everything being dry, many miracle healings happened at that, at that event. There are incorruptible, incorruptible bodies of saints that exist right now that we can all go visit. They are incorruptible. I mean, they are not corrupt and they've been laying there for hundreds of years. Uh, Our Lady of Lourdes and the healings, all the healings that occurred there. Our Lady of Zaytun, which actually happened in Egypt. Uh, Mary, Mother Mary prayed, uh, appeared over a church for days on end, witnessed by many, many folks, many, many folks. Uh, all the Eucharistic miracles, Brian, Lanciano, Buenos Aires, where it's impossible. This wafer was actual heart tissue with living white blood cells. White blood cells cannot exist outside a normal human body. Let's say you're in an operating room for more than seven, eight minutes. You know, white blood cells were fresh and living outside on heart tissue that was proven to be uh, to have been extremely strange. So there's Eucharistic miracles, there's apparitions of Mary, there's healings in the Bible, outside of Bible, all verified primarily by non-Christian sources. These miracles continue to happen. And I think one of Satan's primary objectives is to hide them because if you find out about them then you begin to ask questions like I did. So that's so miracles- interesting. So let's ask the next question then. Um, yeah. You were a Muslim. Now you're passionate about, you know, Christ and Christianity. Like, how did you go from being a Muslim to finding Jesus Christ? So mine is a supernatural story. Um, I haven't told it for a very long time because, quite frankly, when you when you say anything on the supernatural side, you get looks and this and the other. But then I decided that that was that was no, I, I didn't want to do that any longer. Um, I was uh, I came to the United States when I was seven years old, about 1977. And let me just fast forward after school and and business school. I worked in um, across the country, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and I eventually moved to Irvine in Irvine. Uh, I started working for a company, um, uh, for an insurance company, which is what I do. I'm a commercial insurance underwriter. And at that time, I met my wife there or the woman that was going to be my wife. So we got married and had a turbulent four or five years together, not because of anything major. We were just unsaved. I don't know, just the wrong timing kind of situation. So in the year 2000, I came out to California. In 2004, we actually got married. We lived together before that. And in 2005, I went through a divorce. And at that time, when I went through a divorce, it was an uncontested divorce. I remember saying, Michelle, I will just, uh, you know, you can have the house that's on the other, you know, and I just kind of, it was like a movie. I took my suitcase, I took my dog, I took my backpack, and I headed to a one bedroom apartment. For the next six months, I just was in deep, deep depression. I had I had no friends out in California. I had no um, whatever praying I did didn't really give me any any relief whatsoever. So honestly, Brian, what I would do is I would go to my corporate job all day. You know, I would work my nine to five, whatever, eight to six. I would come home. I would drink. If I, if I had access to any other drugs, I would have done that too. My heart hurt so bad. It actually felt, I actually felt my heart aching every single day, month after month after month after month. I was isolated alone. And finally, I began to start getting suicidal. Now, suicide in Islam is also a cardinal sin. So I'm not saying that I would have killed myself, but I got so low spiritually. I got so low emotionally that. I remember the day where my conversion started to happen. I got so low that I remember thinking if there was a gun on that table, even knowing what I know about suicide and cardinal sin, et cetera, you know, uh, it would be a 50% chance that I would use it or not. So that's the spiritual state I was in. And I say that for a reason. I was speaking death and destruction over myself 
um, quite a bit. Um, I actually pulled a few verses out. I'll get to them later. I mean, um, let me let me just show you this real quick. These are all verses on the power of our ver of our words from Matthew, Proverbs, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. So I was speaking all of this, you know, you know, God, I just want to die. I'm just so miserable. I don't want to live like this any longer. If this is what life's all about, just take me out. So I was speaking all these negative things about myself, and I had been doing that for some time. So finally, one Saturday morning, it was summer of 2005, about six months of this destructive lifestyle has been going on. I, um, I woke up Saturday, summer, probably 10, 30, 11 a.m. The, wind, the uh, shades were open, no shadows in the room. The TV, I don't even believe was on. I, on my couch in my one bedroom apartment, completely miserable, heart hurting, completely sober. I couldn't even drink any longer for, for days, many, many, many days on end. I was just tapped out on everything. And the only way I can describe what happened to me after that was God, um, God kind of pierced the veil between the supernatural and the natural world. I think I had spoken so much ill will over myself that he, the, the, our good Lord finally said, okay, let me show you what's on the other side. At that moment, and mind you, I had no thought of Christianity at this time. I, I, I had no, I mean, I was, I was fine being a Muslim. I thought it was the final religion, the final word of God and everything that we just discussed. So there was no, there was no incentive for me to even go to a church or anything like that. I mean, I was just in this bad state. At that moment, out of the corner of the room, the only way I could describe it to you is that and it, it looked like it came in a vortex-like fashion. A black smoke figure came kind of streaming out of the wall. And it was, it was on my periphery. However, I saw it with my natural eyes. As I began to turn my head, and this happened in like a split second or two, but when it's happening, it just seems like it's much longer. It's, it's hard to explain. But as I turned my head, I could see this thing. And it was actually getting bigger. Excuse me. And it looked like it was kind of taking a humanoid form. It was a black mist smoke kind of looking like a humanoid form. The temperature in the room dropped. Some people report the temperature in rooms dropping dramatically. Mine did not drop dramatically, but mine dropped. Now, the, as I turned my head to look at this thing, you know, completely, I don't even know if I was in shock. I mean, how do you, I'm not sure what was going on with my mind. As I'm looking at this thing, I keep on turning my head out of the left corner of my room. And these, I did not see supernaturally, but somehow I know this, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Two angels came down and, and they hit this thing with that I'm looking at with my natural eyes, my physical human eyes. And it looked like a boxer was retreating into a corner. It looked like it was taking body shots. And this thing that was vortex-like emerging and getting bigger began to get smaller and smaller and smaller and then went back into the wall in that in that type of fashion. So I, you know, I'm just sitting there and, you know, this all happened very, very, very quickly. And I'm just sitting there. I don't even remember what was on my mind. But then all I heard, and this was not audible, but this was in my heart. It's the first time God ever spoke to me. He said, go to church. That's what I heard in my heart. And I remember thinking to myself, that, that's odd. Why would I go to church? That makes no sense to me. And I heard, go to church. So, uh, so, that, so I just, I don't really remember actually kind of what I did the rest of that morning, whatever. I think I just sat there for a long period of time. And I began to think of what churches I can start going to. And I was just like, I don't know. And that's how it started. That's how the whole process started for me. Okay, and what church did you end up going to? What church was in your area? Uh, it was an evangelical non-denominational non church called Mountain View Church, and it was I, it was a good church to go to. Um, they spoke the Bible. Uh, everyone was very nice. The music was entertaining, and through that, I started to go to Christian boot camps. I started to go into Bible studies. I started to go into other just social events. Uh, with 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 Christian men, et cetera. And then I just started to kind of uh, grow and develop from there. But I was an I was a I was a very ingrained um, Muslim. And what I mean by that is when I was being brought up, I was uh, you know the the outward praying five times a day, going to a mosque every Friday, et cetera. I'm, I didn't do all that stuff, at least not on a consistent basis. But I was brought up very, very heavily believing that, Muhammad uh, is the prophet of God, and uh, the, the Quran is the final word, and there was some corruption in the New Testament and in the Bible, and Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is not. The, I mean, I believed all those things, and I was brought up with all those things. So those were very ingrained concepts in me. That theology was very ingrained in me. 
So when I started to go to these Christian boot camps and um, and, and other events, um, um, I, it, it took a long time for the knowledge of who Jesus is, was at that time in terms of how the Bible describes it and is obviously for eternity. It took a long period of time for that to kind of go from my head to my heart. But then once I got there, it was it was really, really wonderful. During all this time, um, not, I don't want to make the story too long, but during all this time, every single time, Brian, I went to a Christian boot camp. I went away for the weekend, whatever, something would happen. All of a sudden, I started to get sleep paralysis. Like I had never gotten sleep paralysis before. I would come, I came home after one boot camp once, and I was living with my roommate at the time. Um, and I said, Hey, bud, did this? I mean, it smelled like a skunk had died in my in the house. It was ridiculous. I was like, did, I mean, did a skunk like come in here and you kill it? I mean, where is the skunk? He goes, dude, what are you talking about? It smelled like skunk and sulfur and this and the other. I would get up at five o'clock in the morning to read the Bible on any normal work day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it doesn't matter. Just go get up five o'clock in the morning. All the doors are closed, etc. And I'd be reading the Bible. And then I would, I would just feel this rush behind me. Not like there was a, there was no wind. There was no physical sensation. I would just be like petrified. I, I, I felt like I was coming out of my skin because the fear was so intense. So um, all these things were happening to me. The more and more I started to go down the Christian walk and I never really knew how to fight back. I never knew, you know, until I was being taught, you know, through some deliverance ministry, you know, in the name of Jesus, you know, I rebuke you, etc. And once I started to use the name of Jesus in an authoritative manner, those instances began to die down, but they still occurred pretty regularly. So I Sounds began like the to- devil had it out for you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. As soon as I got on the right path, so to speak, uh, every opposition will come against you. So there I am, which is the opposition that's coming against me. What are they trying to stop me from? What are they trying to stop me from learning from, etc.? But more than that, I began to feel a sense of peace in my heart that I had never, ever experienced ever in my life. I was happy. I was comfortable. I wanted to get up in the morning. I wanted to I mean, even go to work, you know, I enjoy my job. I'm unfortunate, but I mean, I wanted to go to work. I, you know, I had this, I had this piece about me that just, you know, defies all un- natural understanding. And the more I read the Bible and the more I prayed and the more I went to these events, et cetera, the more and more that grew. So it, it, it became very addictive in, in, in that manner. So it was, it was something that I had never felt before. You know, I mean, the Holy Spirit had really entered into, into my life, into my being, and I just welcomed it with, with open arms. So you came to know God, Jesus, and you, you were filled with his spirit. You were happy, joyful, um, apparently going to a church that you liked. So how did you end up at the Catholic church? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that was the last thing on your radar. No, I always thought Catholicism was wrong. Um, I never really looked into it. I was just, I was in this Pentecostal kind of charismatic speaking tongue, spiritual warfare, deliverance, Bible-based evangelical system. Okay. And that was good for me. I mean, it was good teaching. It really was. I mean, I learned a lot. I mean, uh, God uses all different kinds of knives for all different kinds of purposes. And then one day in November of uh, what, 2000, I was watching a YouTube video. Uh, on, on, on something, uh, some kind of um, uh, lecture or whatever the case may be, some kind of sermon. I think it was a Derek Prince sermon. Derek Prince was a, a very famous international Pentecostal type of, of minister. And I began to just kind of, he said, he talks a lot about spiritual warfare and speaking in tongues and this and the other. So I was just listening to one of his uh, sermons and all of a sudden, the same feeling that I had that day when that demon, for lack of a better word, kind of came across when I heard go to church in my heart. I had heard a lot of things. I had heard God speaking to me many times in my soul, in my heart, but sometimes they were just very, very adamant. Sometimes they were very, very pronounced that day when that thing, whatever occurred there, however you want to describe it came after me. I heard go to church. It was so clear, even though it was not audible. I mean, I, you know, it, it was just, it was like you and I talking then on that day in November of 2020, I heard these questions pop up, two questions pop up. I heard, Emra, you study all of the spiritual warfare. Why is it that every single time you study a legitimate, approved exorcism, you know, proven witnesses, the whole nine yards, why is it that a Catholic priest is always called? Then that stopped. And then I began to think about that. And then a couple minutes later, then I heard 
why is the Catholic Church always under constant attack, never ending, never relenting for all these years? That was question two. And question three was, what happened to that first 1,500 years of Christianity? I mean, if you're studying this, what, what about what, what, what was going on in the first 1,500 years? So was the first 1,500 years incorrect and the Reformation happened and whatever happened happened after that? So those are the three basic questions that I heard. And I began to peel back the layers, starting with the spiritual warfare, then studying with why the Catholic Church is constantly under attack. And then, um, you know, then going back to, hey, what did the early church fathers believe? What is the history of Christianity? All I know is this charismatic Pentecostal movement. And that wasn't the movement, if you will. That wasn't Christianity back in 100 AD, 200 AD, 300 AD. So I began to go down that. And as I began to peel back the layers, I mean, the, I feel like the world opened up to me. I was like, oh, my God, this is the truth. And again, it was one of those intangible non five senses, our physical five senses feeling. I was like, this is, this is exactly what I've been looking for my entire life. So at that moment, I jumped in the RCIA and then the Catholic, uh, Catholic journey just, just started. I remember going to adoration for the first time. You know, I could, I didn't have a dry eye on me, you know, to this day, I'll go to Catholic church. I'll, I'll go to church and at least one out of 10 times, Brian, no joking. I could be sitting there alone by myself in the back of the church, whatever the case may be. And halfway in 30 minutes in nothing, no windows are open and I'll get fragrances that come across my face. I'll get floral fragrances and beautiful things in that manner. So the spiritual stuff still continued. It just continued on the positive side versus the negative side. And I mean, that's as honestly as I can possibly describe it. It was such a revelation and it was so adamantly like revealed to me that it was, it was more, I was more certain what was happening to me than you and I talking right now, even though I can't tell you that I, I heard anything or saw anything with my physical five senses. Now, when you heard those questions from God about the Catholic church, um, have you, had you been looking into the Catholic church at that time? Had you been researching Absolutely. it at all? Absolutely not. I thought that I thought I, I, I thought I remember thinking, I don't remember what the situation was, but if the, the concept of priests came up. This is like three weeks before this event happened. And I remember thinking, man, I will never confess to a priest. Why would you ever do that? You know, I mean, I thought Catholicism was absolutely wrong. The papacy, you know, every single thing was absolutely. I was 180 degrees opposite of Catholicism, without a doubt. Interesting. And then all of a sudden that happened and caused you to do research and very, very interesting um, that you ended up in Catholicism out of the blue. I'm sure I'm sure uh, Islam being a Muslim, you know, and then ha your idea of the Catholic Church wasn't a positive one, you know, virtually based off the Crusades and, you know, all the attacks on Islam, you know, and so on. So it's very interesting that you went down that route. And I've heard from many Jews and many Muslims that they've had kind of supernatural encounters with God, uh, which has brought them to Christianity. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And that's happening more and more in the Islamic world. You'll hear a lot of testimonies coming out of Iran. Well, Jesus will visit someone in a dream or some kind of healing will occur, et cetera. So there's a lot of those things happening. All those miracles that we talked about earlier, all those miracles are happening. And there's a lot happening in Persia. There's a lot happening in, in Iran if you research it. So and I do all that because obviously I'm from that from that area to being Turkey. Um, so it, it's a great interest to me. But, you know, God is. God is as real to me now as any physical sensation I've ever had. I, 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 I live honestly to go to church. I go to work so I can pay my bills. I enjoy my motorcycles and then I want to go back to church. You know, uh, I've never felt anything like I have felt in adoration. Um, uh, as I, as God begins to educate me more and use me more, I began to share this faith and the beauties of it and the rosary and learning Latin and, you know, uh, all the tools of Catholicism, which are endless, by the way. I mean, it's awesome to be able to go to church every day as well, if you can make it, you know. Um, the first confession I went to, I, I couldn't believe how I felt afterwards. It wasn't easy to go to your first confession, but when I was absolved of those sins, it was a powerful feeling. I saw the reason for the priesthood in the system of Christianity. I saw the reasons why Jesus left us these tools, for lack of a better word. I saw the reasons for the rosary as our primary spiritual warfare weapon. Um, and um, yeah, it just, uh, it's endless. I mean, 
I used to wonder why the um, um, why uh, becoming a priest would take. I heard seven, eight, nine years sometimes. But there's so much to know. You know, the body of faith is so large that it, it, it's just fascinating to me. Yeah, very fascinating. And it's what's also fascinating is that you. Um, you know, said that you've never felt closer to God. You've never felt so good, so peaceful, so joyful in adoration and praying to God in the Catholic faith, which is saying something coming from a Pentecostal background, which is really all about feelings in many ways, you know, and having that experience and that encounter with God. Yeah. 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 So, um, so God kind of stair stepped me down the road, you know, and I continue to go down that path. So yeah, it's, uh, it, yeah. I was just going to say, he did the same thing for me. Um, you know, he kind of gave me powerful experiences of him as well. Um, yeah. you know, like turned me inside out, upside down and backwards, very powerful encounters, kind of like St. Paul just got whacked, you know, by the power of God, you could never mistake that it was God. And when I started giving my life to him and following him, that's when I got attacked spiritually. Soon as I went home from college, my Catholic college, I just got destroyed by the devil. A lot of demonic warfare, a lot of um, not demonic possession, but more like oppression and especially right. obsession and um, tormenting me day and night. And it really, till God freed me from that and showed me his power and gave me his peace. Oh man, it was all out warfare against me. And um, you know, that's what the devil does. He tries to get you, but you know, I agree with you. I've never felt so much peace and joy and love times a thousand in my life. You know, I've had a lot of good times. I've known a lot of good people. And it all is like just black and white compared to the beautiful colored world of God who indwells you, who fills you with his infinite love. Absolutely. You know, Brian, I, I, I didn't know that about your about your history, but it, it certainly makes sense to me, obviously. But, you know, when I was going through what you went through, when you came back, all that oppression, obsession, et cetera, I, mean, I was being attacked every single night. Almost. I mean, almost every night I wasn't recording it. So I, I, you know, and this was many years ago now, but I mean, I would go into sleep paralysis. I would know that something is on me. I couldn't move. I would try to drill out the word Jesus just for it to let go. I mean, this, this happened over many for over a long period of time. I would see things, uh, shadows moving here and there, this and the other. So all of that fear stuff was going on. And I can tell you now that ever since I started the rosary and I started doing a whole bunch of other things uh, with, uh, on, down the Catholic um, faith and confession and all the sacraments, really, um, I've never I, I've never slept so well. I've never been so comfortable. And it's um, it's a good feeling. Awesome. Praise God for that. Praise God. Um, I don't know if you heard on our channel, the testimony of uh, Christina Mohini. She's a Hindu convert to the Catholic faith. We interviewed her. And uh, she was actually possessed by 13 demons. She had seven suicide attempts. She was a total and complete bankrupt disaster basket case who was just going off the rails. And she said she was praying and not one of her 330 million gods could help her. But then she right. read Jesus Christ and just <laughs> destroyed that darkness, blew it, obliterated that darkness and just yeah. gave her the most ultimate freedom, joy, peace, power that she had ever experienced in her whole life. And now she's a Catholic and just basking in the love and you know beauty of Jesus Christ. And that's, he's done that across the world with so many people because he's a good, wonderful God, a wonderful yeah. savior. Yeah. He doesn't let us go. I'm going to look, I'm, I have not heard that one, but I'm going to, oh, absolutely. I, I live for those testimonies. I really do. That's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. And if I remember uh, for our audience, I'll link it here too. And at the end, if you guys would like to see that video, it's very powerful. And in fact, we also interviewed a lady who was a, a Buddhist and into new age. She was a stripper and she actually had a very powerful conversion with Jesus too. So, you know, yeah. I'll link those, you know, cause people do like these. Um, did you have any final thoughts before we finish up here? No, I mean, um, I just kind of, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share my story. Uh, I, 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 the only thing I, I kind of wanted to leave from my perspective is this, you know, don't be afraid of the supernatural. Okay. Society and, 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 and the devil will try to uh, suppress the spiritual because, you know, 
if we stay in the natural, it takes away a lot of our spiritual power when we're linked to God. So just don't be afraid of exploring and believing and listening and miracles are happening all around you. Research them. They will help develop your faith. They will help strengthen your faith. These miracles are real. These healings are real. Spiritual warfare is real. Time and time and time again, it's proven by testimonies. It's proven by scientific evidence. It's proven by non-believers, believers, etc. And the only faith that provides that um, is Christianity and particularly the Catholic faith. I mean, so many of the things that I look up with, 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 um, with the um, apparitions of Mary and this and the other and the healings are directly tied to Catholicism. So really just dive into them, guys, dive into them, do your own research, you know, study the miracles, study what's going on in the spiritual world. It is more real than our physical world. We're just right now trapped in this world. So that's really helped build my faith up. Not that I really needed it because of all the things that happened to me way back when, but as soon as I began to see all these miracles that still occur to this day, including now Christina's testimony, which I'm going to listen to, these things just, just emphasize the fact of of how real Jesus is. And Jesus was and is exactly who he said he was. Um, I mean, he is, he was God incarnate, came down to save us, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these things are very, very real and, and they could not be more accurate and they could be, and they could not be more powerful. So. Amen. And Christina was actually a really well uh, established Hindu. She was really high up there, the highest caste. And, you know, she was very prominent. She was an actress who I think did over a hundred movies, um, in India. And, um, now she does deliverance ministry. So, you know, she wow. helps out with deliverance ministry. So it's really a powerful testimony. Um, and if anyone's interested in that, you know, check out our video. We have a video called, the, um, the five levels of demonic possession. It talks about the different types of demonic attacks. If people are interested in the darker side and how strong Jesus is, we also have um, a video on miracles. Uh, so if you want to, you know, hear about miracles and see the miracles that still happen today, you can check that video out and, you know, feel free to go back in time on our YouTube channel here. We have so many videos on so many topics. If you want to yeah. go closer to God, if you want to really go deep with God, and you don't know how to do that. Go check out our playlist, the Catholic truth, prayer, and spirituality. And we will teach you how to come close to God. But, um, Emerald, I want to really thank you for coming on uh, our show today and, you know, sharing. It's not every day that a Muslim comes to Catholicism, though I feel like it's becoming more numerous. I feel like so many Muslims are starting to convert to Christianity. And, uh, but I, you know, here it is in the flesh, we're getting to hear it. So thank you for sharing that with us and your, your spiritual uh, testimony as well. Absolutely, Brian. No, thank you for having me on. It was great. Great experience. I love the channel. Keep up the good work. So uh, it's, it's great. Good learning too. Thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you for watching us. Uh, if you love what we do and you, you know, we help inspire your faith, please consider supporting our ministry. You know, we have a PayPal, we have a Patreon where you can support monthly, one time, yearly, uh, whatever you want that you'll help us to continue saving souls and changing lives. And weekly, almost daily, we have people on Catholic Truth telling us that they're becoming Catholic because of our ministry, or we had a hand in helping them become Catholic, or they're staying Catholic because of our ministry, or we're, they've just fired up their faith and helped them to understand it. Whatever it is, our ministry is reaching so many people. So if you could support us, we would really appreciate it. And if you would love to follow us for daily inspiration, check out our TikTok, our uh, Instagram, our Facebook, and our social media pages. And um, if you would like, please make sure to like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment. All of these things help to make our videos more popular so people can see them. Thank you all for tuning in. We love you. Please pray for us as we're always praying for you. God bless you. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate. I'm the video editor here at Catholic Truth. And I just wanted to say on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for taking some time to watch our videos and learn more about your faith. You guys really make this channel possible, and we truly appreciate you being here. So thanks again, and God bless.